Good morning. Good morning. All right. To those that are in our Zoom, a pleasant uh, good morning to everybody. And um, even though it's raining, we are so glad that all of us are here uh, with one heart, praising the Lord in spirit and in truth. Now, let me ask you all this question. I know you are all happy, but I want you to raise your hands if you are happy. Raise your hands. Raise your hands if you're happy. Amen. Amen. Because the Bible said in James chapter 5, verse 13, is anybody happy? Then what should you do? Let him sing praises. All right? So sing and be happy as the song goes. And uh, before we go to the lesson, the part that said, uh, that says, the last part, Brother Kennedy, sing and be happy today, press along to the goal, and then leave it the way he will use the song, that the world that it belongs, let it use and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Now, I want all of us to repeat that. Lift your voice and praise him in song. One, two, three. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Amen. Now, this time, I want you to look at the person beside you while you sing that song. All right? Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, it's a good feeling, right? Now, James puts it that if you are happy, then you should sing praises to God. Not because you want to be happy. Right? Not because you want to be happy. James said, if you are happy, you should sing praises to God. Then if every day you are happy, then every day you must sing praises to God. Amen? But, you know, singing is such a contagious you know, thing. Because when you are singing and the person beside you is not happy, now when he saw you singing, when he sees you singing, now because that's contagious, he will sing with you. And soon he will be happy and he will be singing also because he is now happy. You get the point? That's why lift your voice to God and sing your heart away to him. God is good. And all the time God is good. All right. Amen. <clears throat> the question, is it well with my soul? There is a song, Is It Well With My Soul? And the other one is, It Is Well With My Soul. Now, a question that needs to be answered truthfully by all of us. Now, sometimes we, we, I, I call this, we are playing Christian um, and say that, yeah, you know, Brother Mike, it, uh, it is well with my soul. You know, playing Christian means we just pray to God whenever there is a need. In our lives we just go to church whenever we feel like it you know we go to church whenever we have time for the lord you know we do this just to make us feel better we do this just to make us uh appeal uh to to, to appeal christian life and so we have a better reason to say that yeah i'm good i go to church every sunday you know i pray to god uh, i'm good and good so it is well with my soul but you know christianity is not just playing christian um if we ever just feel like it christianity is number one is a christ-centered life our life evolves around jesus christ putting him first above all things you know, not just when you have time second christianity is a life you live each day it is a life you live each day, not just every Sunday that you, we all come together and sing to God and praise God. It's a daily uh, walk with God, becoming more and more like Christ, not just when you feel like living 
like it. You know? And to measure up with God and to see if, if it is really well with our soul, we must go to the Bible, the authority, and see how Christ lives and compare our life with it, you know, and to know how God wants us to live. In 1 John chapter 2, 3 to 6, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone <clears throat> obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. You know, knowing Jesus does not mean that you just know about Jesus. You know, just it does not mean that you just have to know his life. Knowing Jesus is good. Knowing the story of Jesus is good. But it means more than that. It is keeping, obeying his commands. Knowing means you have built a relationship with Jesus Christ that you are in agreement with him, that you are moving along, you are progressing with Jesus Christ, and as you move along, you are enjoying your life with him. And it calls for an obedient faith. Okay. Now go into verse four. It says, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. So there it is again. We can see that knowing Jesus is obeying Jesus Christ. It is not about playing Christian when we just feel like it. And John goes further by saying, we are a liar. We are a liar if you just know Jesus and do not do his will. And many people, they know about Jesus Christ, but they never do uh, did his will. So the Bible calls them what? A liar, not me. I'm not calling them a liar, but the Bible is calling them a liar. If you know Jesus by name, if you know Jesus superficially, but you are not obeying his will, then the Bible calls you a liar. But the Bible calls me a liar. And that is the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. And sometimes we don't want to, to listen to the truth because it hurts us. But it is what it is. You see, knowing Jesus is about obeying Jesus. And there's a great lesson uh, here. And the lesson is to know Jesus <clears throat> demands a deep acquaintance and intimate relationship with him not just superficially knowing Jesus Christ. Now we go to verse five. Verse five said, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. You see, it tells us that our obedience to God shows our true love for him. Our obedience shows our true love for God because love is manifested by our obedience. Okay. Now, the next part of verse 5 and verse 6, <clears throat> it says, this is how we know we are in him. How? Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus lived. Okay. That is a Christ-centered life living daily with Jesus Christ and becoming more and more like him each day. Now, if we feel that our only obedience to God is going to church every Sunday or uh, every midweek and the rest of the days, you know, we're just doing what we please us to do, then that is playing Christian. And we must be very careful there are many who say that they are Christians, but they are not doing the will of God. We must be very careful. And that is one of Satan's scheme. Now, if you claim that you know Jesus, then obey him. 
If you claim to abide in him, then live like Jesus. Okay. Now we go to verse 6. Okay. Oh, before going to verse 6, you know. We might be looking uh, physically healthy, right? By just merely looking at all of you, you are all healthy. But spiritually, deep inside, sometimes we are spiritually so malnourished. Okay? Just like the first photo that I showed you. We are out of shape spiritually. And we're just hanging on for their life because our spiritual life is so much is so out of shape and there are so many things that take us out of shape there are so many things that take us so captive in this world hindering us from knowing jesus christ and from having this deep relationship with him and as the bible uh, said in hebrews and the sin that so easily entangles us and hold us back from developing a real relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, sin is what takes us captive. Now, please note, what takes us captive so easily by the devil is a snare are the very same blessings that God has given us to enjoy. If you will put your mind to this, you will know that the very blessings that God is giving us are the same blessings that the devil is using to take us captive so that we will not grow in maturity with Christ, so that we will not have a deeper relationship with God. Now what you are seeing, everything that you see, what you are feeling, the devil is turning us away from God. For example, money. That's a wonderful blessing from God. But, you know, what Satan is doing is he is feeding our minds with greed. He is feeding your mind with greed. A never-ending need and want for more. That's why many people are going after money because they feel like that's the most important thing in life. And that is what Satan is doing to all of us. Now look at what the Bible said. As his divine power has given to, to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything God has given, has provided to us. So that we can have a good life and most especially live a godly life to the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue god has given you and i whatever i needed to survive it is all out there all the resources it's it's there including the talent including the ability so that you and I can survive. You see, last week I was talking to Brother Carlos regarding painting. God has given him talent to survive. And everyone of us, Brother Jerry, God has given him talent to survive every day. And God has given us all the resources that we need. You need paint, you go to the store. You need nails, you go to the store. God has given us everything. You need food. There it is. But Satan, what, is his, what he is doing is he is turning those blessings and turn us away from God. He turned our wants, our needs into greed so that we will turn our backs from God, so that we will not have time for God. First John chapter 2, 15, do not love the world. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Now God said, do not love the world or anything in the world. You see, God already gave everything. God already gave everything to our satisfaction. But Satan again is using these things 
to keep our minds so busy, you know, and going after material things and other matters that pertain to life so that we will not have time for God, even Sunday. We're all Christians. Those who accepted the Lord, all believers, should come together, worship God, praise God. But sometimes we choose to work Sunday. But sometimes we, do, we choose to do other things on Sunday. Why? Because that is what Satan is doing. He is poisoning our mind. And the Lord said, do not love the world or anything in the world. What we are now doing is we are loving the world so much that we don't have time to love the giver of the blessings, which is God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this age, Satan, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. You see, the devil is so cunning. He will use everything in his power to deceive us, to take our, our, our minds and our eyes off from God. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see not only the minds of the unbelievers, but also those that are in Christ. So that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. What we are seeing are our needs, our wants, our greed, that we forget about the giver of the blessing. God, who is the image of God. Now, what did the God of this age, referring to Satan, uh, do? He poisoned our minds. Satan made, uh, he, he made us see different, differently. Okay? And uh, this wonderful blessings from God, instead of thanking God, we are forgetting about God. He's making us see things differently. And he's using his trickery to turn us against God. Now, what they become now to us are lust and pride. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Anything now becomes lust and pride instead of blessings from the Lord. Again, I keep on saying this, that blessings should draw us near to God, not far away from God. If those blessings are keeping us away from God, then it's turning, becoming a curse for us. If what you have right now is turning you against God and keeping you away from God, by all means, throw those things away. Throw those things away, I'm telling you. You should suffer here right now than suffer in the afterlife. I'm telling you that. I would rather suffer in this world than suffer in the afterlife. Now having said that, Satan is very cunning. We should never underestimate his abilities. He can feed our minds with thoughts like, you know, hey, you know, Peter, uh, it's, it's okay to work so hard. God knows that you needed money for your family. You can, you can focus on God at the latter part of your life when you are already retired. You know, John, you know, God knows that you need a time to relax. So work from Monday to Saturday. Then on Sunday, take your time to relax. God would understand you. Take your family out. You have the whole day for you and your family. Go out. See, God, you know, I'm sorry, Satan is using that kind of scheme, that kind of trickery to trick our minds and to say, oh yeah, God would understand. God would understand. I'm, I'm, I'm busy this Sunday. You know, God would understand. You know, I, I, will, I will treat my wife. I will treat my kids, my family. We'll go out. God would understand. He is an understanding God. He is a loving God. The devil is using those thoughts to turn you away from God. Soon, you will find out that you are so far away from God. 
because you are so accustomed not praying to God, not reading your Bible, and not going to church. See? Now, to be well with your soul, we need someone stronger than the devil. Again, as I've told you, never under underestimate the power of the devil. You know, you without God, I believe this in my heart, without God, without the presence of God in your life, you can never defeat the devil. You can never defeat the devil because you need someone stronger than the devil because the devil is stronger than you and craftier than you. And you see, Jesus referred to the devil as a strong man. Let's go through. You need Jesus, okay? Someone stronger. You need Jesus Christ. Now we go to Mark chapter 3. Let me illustrate this further. Jesus is the one talking. Who is powerful? Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Jesus, the strong man here, is Satan. Jesus was referring to Satan as a strong man. Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Jesus is telling us we need someone stronger than the strong man. We need Jesus because he is stronger than the devil. So in order for us to resist the devil, we need someone stronger. And that is Jesus Christ. Because the whole world in 1 John chapter 5, 19, because this world lies in the power of the evil one. And you cannot overcome the evil one if you do not have Jesus Christ in your life because Jesus is the one stronger and more powerful than the devil. So that's why you need Jesus Christ. Even to us believers, even to us who are already in, in the body of Christ, here is a warning for us. Therefore, beloved, since you already know these things, be on your guard. Be on your guard. Don't ever think that you are so strong. Be on your guard. So that you will not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure standing. This is a, a reminder to all of us that is in the body of Christ that we must be on our guard always. Never underestimate the power of the devil. Now, how are we going to make sure that we will not carry it away? How are we going to make sure that we are secured? Now, the next verse will tell us how. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, but now and the day of eternity. Amen. It says grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge. Growing is a continuous process. We stop growing when we are dead. You stop learning when you are dead. Growing means abiding in Jesus until we all die. It's a never-ending process. Learning never stops. Every time that somebody will stand up here and I'll be sitting right there, I know that I will learn something. I know that I will learn something. I will go to any lectureship that I can attend because I know I will, I can, I will and can learn something. You see, never stop learning, never stop growing. That's the only reason and that's the only way how we can be secured and how we can fight the schemes of the devil. Abide in Christ always. Now, to be really well with your soul, you need to be like a deer. Be like a deer. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. In New Living Translation, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. Now, we all love this verse. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul long after you. See, we all love that song. See? Now, Again, we even, we even sing that song, right? Now, it talks about our longingness for God. Just like a deer 
longs for the water. But what can we learn from, from this verse? Now, this verse is rich in meaning, and we will unlock the meaning and the truth uh, hidden in this wonderful verse. You know, the deer, they are very good at locating streams, finding streams for water so that they could survive. Now, they go to streams of water for many reasons. I have listed, I have listed uh, two. Um, they go to streams of water for these reasons. Okay? So why are the deer uh, looking for streams of water? First is to quench his thirst. Now, to quench his thirst. Now, why was he thirsty? Why is the deer thirsty? Because of drought. Drought, second, because of walking and going about his life. He's tired and he wants to take a drink of water. And third, he is probably running away from being hunted by a predator or by an enemy. So tired of running that he needs water. Okay? So those are the possible answers. Now, just like the author, the psalmist, he described his thirst for the Lord like that of the deer thirst for water. In the same manner, when David was in the desert uh, of Judah, he thirsted for God in Psalm 63 verse 1. When he was in the desert of Judah, you God are my God, earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you. Now, just like the deer and David thirst for water, we also thirst for God. We thirst for God when there's a spiritual drought. We long for God when there's a spiritual drought in us. We are so tired of our life seeing that there is no purpose in it. And when we are running away from the devil's snare and want to be free, we go to God. We long for God. But the question is, what does it mean to thirst for God? What does it mean? Now, in general, a person can live, they say, 30 to 40 days without food. But a person cannot live longer than three days without water. That's, that's generally speaking. Okay? Thirst for God, therefore, means a strong spiritual desire for God's presence as he is deemed an absolute necessity for life. You just cannot live without God, period. The fact of the matter is, when you are so thirsty, you will not pick, a can, you will not pick up a can of soda to quench your thirst, but you will pick up water to quench your thirst, right? So same goes with God. When it is not well with your soul, when you have that spiritual drought and get tired of living your life and you want to be free from the devil's hold, the only one that can truly quench your spiritual thirst, that can fill that spiritual void and make it all well with your soul is God. And the Bible said, He is the living water. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him what? A well of water springing up to eternal life. Now second, what is the other possible answer as to why the deer is in the stream of water? He is there because for safety reason. The deer is in the streams of water because for safety reasons. You know, the deer, they will not only go to streams of water because they are thirsty. No. They will also go there. It's intentional. They will intentionally go there for refuge. You know, we know how we know that how sensitive the 
the smell of the animals. So their, their smell, their sense of smell, they are so sensitive. When a predator is hunting a deer, he can smell the deer even so many yards away. He can smell the deer, the scent of the deer, and he can track that deer. And to escape the predator, the deer will have to go to the streams of water, not to drink, but to swim. But to swim, to take a bath. In doing so, in doing so, the scent from the air will dissipate. And the predator will now have any clue for where the deer went. That's the reason why the deer goes to streams of water for safety reason. The predator won't be able to send the deer and this leaves the predator wondering where the deer went. You know, as he continued to <laughs> sniff the air, he will be at a loss. Now the psalmist is telling us that God is our refuge, just like the streams of water are a refuge for the deer. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer. He is my shield in whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. God is our stronghold, a mighty tower, mighty tower of refuge that no one can penetrate. And not only that, the psalm is telling us God will subdue. He will defeat our enemy if we run to him. That's why the deer ran towards the stream of water, swim so that he will take refuge and save his life. See, now comparing Psalm 42 verse 1 to that of Psalm 63 verse 1 when, when David was in the desert of Judah. In Psalm 42, the deer was running away from the predator okay, to escape. Now in Psalm 63, David was running away also from the predator, from King Saul, because King Saul wanted him dead. So he was also running away. In both instances, we can sense an outpouring of longing for God when they are running for their lives. David said, Lord, I thirst for you. Lord, you are my refuge. Just like the deer running, running for his dear life, looking for streams of water, and he will swim to that water because that is his safety. When we are so spiritually, when we have that void in us, when it is not really well with our soul, we must run to God, for he is our safe refuge. Remember, when you long for something, when you are longing for something, something is missing. Something is lacking in you. That's why you are longing for something. We long for healing because we lack good health. We long for employment because we lack financial resources. We long for God because what? We lack what makes life complete. And this coincides with our definition of what it means to thirst for God. God's presence is deemed an absolute necessity for life. See, now one final thought. One final thought. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. These things all that you ever wanted, all that you crave for in this life, the Bible said, they are fading away. Look at the things that you have now. They will fade away. And soon, your life too will fade away. The last four and the desires. But anyone who does what pleases God 
this is wonderful, we live forever. If what matters to you most in this life is not God, I want you to think about this verse very, very sincerely. Everything you desire for, everything that you crave for, everything that you wanted so much in your life, in exchange for God, while you are alive, the Bible said, it will be gone. It will be gone. It will fade away. Even your very life. But the one thing you left out, the most important thing, the one thing that you missed, the one thing that you ignore, the one thing that you left out in your life while you are alive, which we all should have given attention to, is God. We forget about God and we miss and we are missing life, eternal life. Is it well with your soul? If you have not yet accepted our Lord Jesus Christ, ask again the question, is it really well with my soul? If your answer is yes, it is well with your soul, then with love and sincerity, let me ask a rhetorical question. How can it be well when what truly makes it well is missing in your life? Jesus. Now I want you to come out, you know, go to God, repent and be baptized and enjoy your life. Enjoy your journey with Jesus. Now for all of us who have accepted our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is it really well with our souls? Is it really well with my soul? Maybe we are just hiding in the name Christian because we were baptized into Christ. In reality, it is not well with our souls because we are struggling spiritually. But let me tell you this, whatever your struggle in life, the devil is the least interested in your life. And those that are in his fold are the least interested in your life. If you are struggling, my dear brothers and sisters, I encourage you to talk to someone to help you. Let us help you back to the streams of water, to the living water. Talk to someone so that it will be well with your soul. I hope that all of us here, our souls are well and that we can truly say it is well with our soul. God bless everybody and shall we all stand up as we sing the song of invitation. Good morning.